I'd like to acknowledge that I am recording this podcast on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Early. Well, today we're going to explore why we get sick. Why does disease even happen? Why do things go wrong? It's interesting because, uh, well, it's something we fundamentally should be aware of. In order to solve a problem, it often helps to know what that problem is. And it's interesting to consider uh, what, how medical practitioners, or many, many medical practitioners, approach healthcare. They approach it with a degree of skepticism, which is important, but also curiosity. And it's interesting to consider when that curiosity actually starts, or at which point in the medical education the curiosity starts. For many, and I know I was guilty of this when I was uh, in uh, studying dentistry and five-year degree, and the first two years were basic subjects like anatomy, physiology, histology, the study of cells, microbiology, and biochemistry. And to be honest, I couldn't wait to get over those subjects. I was just so pleased I passed them and I could forget about them and move on to the real stuff of what real practitioners did. And we started to study pathology and then also pharmacology. And we also studied as dentists how to fix problems in the mouth. So, And for medical practitioners, the study of pathology, the study of disease and pharmacology how to manage that disease is, for many, where the real medicine starts. And that is where their curiosity continues through their professional life. However, I would argue that it's actually, and this is something I have learned over the last 20 or 30 years, that actually going back and studying those basic sciences is really important because they give us a clue as to why somebody might experience a disease why somebody might be unwell, because ultimately it's an imbalance in the physiology and the workings on a cellular level and how biochemistry interacts with your your health. And that really is why we get sick. Well, my guest today is going to give us a really wonderful, holistic perspective on this and, and it is just a real eye-opener for me, as, and I hope it will be for you as well. My guest is Dr. Sarah Myhill. She is a British doctor running her own specialist clinic in Kingston, Wales, in the United Kingdom. She's, her focus is on myalgic encephalitis, which many will know also as chronic fatigue. There is a subtle distinction between the two, but they're very closely linked. Her website is an incredible resource. <clears throat> it has articles and information based on her treatment and it treatments of patients, and it runs to over 900 web pages and has received over 6 million individual visits. Sarah's view is that myalgic encephalitis and chronic fatigue is characterized by a cellular metabolic mitochondrial dysfunction and has published several studies. She's treated in excess of 10,000 sufferers over her, well, it's actually a 40-year career. And in today's episode, we dive into Mitochondria 101. I loved her, you'll love her description of it's mitochondrial, not hypochondrial, or mitochondria, not hypochondria. Anyway, she explains her philosophy of medicine, and it is a wonderful discussion. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Dr. Sarah Mayle. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me, Ron. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Ever since we first met uh, at the conference that we did last year, the Global Conference for ACNEM, the Australian Australasian College of Nutritional and environmental medicine. I was so looking forward to having you on my podcast and sharing you with my listeners. Look, we've been in practice, and I know we both have been in practice for quite a few years now. Um, let's say over 30, almost, yeah, well, or, well let's say it, 40 years. Um, you know, how do you reflect on medical, the modern medical approach to health and disease? Well, 
the shameful thing is during that those 40 years, it has not evolved one jot. Modern conventional medicine is still in the dark ages. Why? Because they are still not looking for disease causation. They, are, they continue to treat depression as if it is a deficiency of SSRIs. They continue to treat you know, arterial problems as if it's a deficiency of statins. Now, it is intellectually shocking what is happening in the conventional world. And it's doctors like you and me who are asking the real questions why. Because modern medicine muddles up clinical pictures and diagnoses. So, for example, it will tell you that Parkinson's disease is a diagnosis. It's not. Parkinson's disease is a clinical picture that might be, be caused by a drug side effect. It might be Lyme disease. Um, um, it might be a prion disorder. It might be an arteriosclerotic disorder. You know, so that's what you and I are trying to do. That's what the real doctors are doing, the naturopathic physicians, the eco-medical um, doctors, you know, the functional medicine doctors. We're asking the question why, because that gives us the true diagnosis. Because if you can identify the underlying mechanisms by which symptoms and disease arise, then that has obvious implications for, for, for management. You know, is this person ill because they're deficient, because they're toxic, um, 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 you know, because they're allergic, because they've got a chronic infection? You know, if you can answer those questions, then you can start to deal and treat them properly from first principles with logical scientific medicine. And that's what we are all about. Mm. It's so interesting, Sarah, to hear you say from first principles, because we all moved through our degrees and the undergraduate part of our the early years were all about anatomy, physiology, histology, biochemistry. And for most practitioners, we just couldn't wait to finish that so we could get all that all that crap out of the way, and then we could start studying pathology and, most importantly, how pharmacology and how to fix the, how to manage these things. Isn't it interesting that we just ignore the why, but we've gone straight to how to manage? Exactly, exactly. And the story I always tell is biochemistry, which was the biggest, you know, ball ache in undergraduate medicine and yeah. but it was an exam you had to get get through and you know you'd what you'd stay up all night um on black coffee and chocolate biscuits mugging it all up regurgitate all this stuff about mitochondria which you thought was a load of rubbish on the exam paper and then you'd forgotten it by the afternoon and you know hoped you'd passed but the fact of the matter as you know mitochondria special area of interest mitochondria are involved in every single disease pathology you care to mention from well, well, you, yeah, you've mentioned mitochondria, and I and I and I think I agree with you there. Um, but I wondered if we might just go to mitochondria one hundred and one. Like, tell us, tell us about mitochondria. Okay, well, mitochondria exist in every living cell in nature. So you look out in your window and you see grass, trees, um, hedges, sheep, cattle. Every single living cell in nature has mitochondria within them. Um, uh, um, and they power the cell because without power, that cell is dead. You turn the power off and you're immediately dead. So mitochondria is a common, are a common biological unit that deliver energy to cells efficiently. And if you haven't got mitochondria or the mitochondria goes slow, then that cell will go slow. If the cell goes slow, then that organ goes slow. If that organ goes slow, you're slipping into organ failure. And therefore they're implicated in dementia, heart disease, cancer, you know, diabetes, you name it, and mitochondria are involved. They are the energy providers. And you look at any system in the world, and it doesn't matter if it's a factory or a car or, you know, any system, if you haven't got energy, it's not going to work. So they are very, very important players in the whole of medicine. Now, now we were talking about our wonderful courses in biochemistry when we were studying and one of the things we remember, or I remember from it, and I, of course, have been following it more closely, is to get from one point to another point, it needed certain things to be added to make that process occur. And all That's you where, got from that was energy. <laughs> and, and all you got from that was energy, but you needed those cofactors, which are? Well... Mitochondria can go slow for lots of reasons, and there's mm. a whole bunch of cofactors. I mean, you know, we have kind of got used to the modern medical paradigm of one symptom, one drug, you know, and away you go. And it ain't like that. It's, it's much more complicated than that. 
And the way I explain it to patients is, you know, if you consider that the body is a language, then all the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, which is essential to write those sentences, those paragraphs, those books, that literature, you know, without any one of those, then it's not going to work. So you might not use the word X, the letter X very often. Without X, it ain't going to be very sexy. It's going to be a boring old book. And it's exactly the same with the human body. You need A to Z for it to function normally. And we call those vitamins uh, and lots of other things as well. So the starting point to treat absolutely all pathology is you've got to provide the body with all those raw materials. And that's all about diet and food and cooking. And don't laugh now. I probably spend more time talking about diet and food and cooking and meals than all other subjects put together. Because if you get that right, the body can heal and repair itself. It wants to heal and repair itself. It's been healing and repairing itself for hundreds of millions of years. And OK, we can chuck in a few supplements and that will speed things up or, or deal with rate limiting steps. But food and diet is essential for, for mitochondrial function and for normal biochemistry. I love that metaphor, that metaphor of the alphabet. I've, I'm, I'm going to use that, Sarah. I will credit you with it, but I'm going to use that again, that you don't need to credit it. <laughs> I've got lots of ideas out there. And if people help themselves to them, that's great. I don't need yeah, my yeah, yeah. to be credited. But it is it is true. It is a wonderful metaphor to use that without our alphabet, um, our language is meaningless. And without all of the micronutrients, micronutrients and cofactors, um, our, our bodies are, well, not meaningless, but they become diseased. Yeah, they start to go slow. And uh, I mean, if you slow up brain conduction by ooh, um, a certain percent, I can't remember what the figure is, you've got dementia. Mm. So, uh, and you can explain much of dementia simply in terms of poor energy delivery mechanisms. Um, you're, I'm sure you're aware of the work of Dale Bredesen, neurologist, California. He can reverse dementia by correcting the mitochondrial dysfunction through diet. Ketogenic diet is the starting point. So yes, the, the important thing to recognize is that the tools that we are using are incredibly powerful. They're much better than drugs. Okay, it's harder work. They don't work overnight. But you're, we, you and I are affecting cures. That is a very different from what the conventional docs are doing, who are managing problems, maybe controlling symptoms, maybe postponing pathology, but the overall progression is downhill. Let's look at heart failure, for example. Heart failure, if you have uh, been diagnosed by, with heart failure by a conventional doctor, the prognosis is awful, 50% dead in two years. If you treat heart failure with nutritional medicine, you will cure those patients. And I have any number of patients diagnosed with heart failure, um, off their drugs, on their nutritional supplements, 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, doing very nicely, thank you very much. Why? Because we cured them. And that's what proper medicine should be all about. Yes. Well, tell us a little bit more about what goes wrong. Before we dive in, you've mentioned Bredesen, and I'd love to have him on as a guest as well, because he does some phenomenal work. Maybe you could give us a little bit of an insight there as a preview. But what can go wrong with mitochondria? What, what are some of the things that cause mitochondrial dysfunction? Okay. Mitochondria can go wrong for any number of reasons. The first thing is you've got to have the right fuel in the tank. Now, the problem with um, Western darts is it's based on carbohydrate. It's sugar. And OK, mitochondria can use sugar as a fuel, but it's very damaging to them. Lots of free radicals, premature aging. So the starting point is you've got to have the right fuel, and that's ketones. And that comes from fat and from eating fiber. Secondly, they've got to have the raw materials to work. And, you know, we have nasty bits of biochemistry like oxidative phosphorylation and Krebs citric acid cycle and respiratory enzymes. But, it's, but essentially, they're nasty um, names that describe the processes by which we generate energy or the mitochondria generate energy. And they need certain things like they need coenzyme Q10, which is a very important electron donor and acceptor within mitochondria. They need magnesium, which I think of as the spark plug of our engine. Without magnesium, you can't make ATP and you can't get energy from ATP. We need acetyl L-carnitine, which I think of as the, the nozzle, the, the, the fuel pipe that gets um, um, acetate groups from the cell cycle 
into the mitochondria where they can be used as a fuel. Um, they need vitamin B3. Vitamin B3 is essential to make um, NAD and NADH, again, important intermediates. So if you haven't got those cogs, you know, those, those wheels, those bits of micro machinery within mitochondria, then they can't work. Then the mitochondria have got to be free from toxic stress. If you poison them with something, um, then they will go slow. And I kind of work up to this in the 1990s when I started seeing farmers locally with what was described then as sheep dip flu. But they were using organophosphate chemicals to dip their sheep to get rid of the, um, uh, the mites and the ticks and the parasites uh, that were uh, living on the sheep's wool. And okay, it works very well to kill uh, the sheep, the, the ticks, but it also kills the human beings as well because organophosphates inhibit oxidative phosphorylation for very obvious biochemical reasons. Another group of people who were also poisoned by organophosphates were the Gulf War veterans. The Gulf War was the most toxic, poisonous war that's ever been fought in human history. And organophosphates were widely used as, as chemical weapons and they're also used in the desert to control sand flies. And those poor soldiers in the front line were saturated with them. They were using organophosphates, for example. They sprayed any prisoners with organophosphates to um, get rid of you know, body lice, for example. Wow. But they were poisoned. So again, organophosphates in, in, inhibit oxidative phosphorylation. But guess what? It's not just organophosphates. You know, so many chemicals will interfere. Heavy metals, you know, um, mercury, aluminium, lead, arsenic will interfere. Um, volatile organic compounds. In fact. You know, I often do tests of toxicity on my patients, which might be a fat biopsy. It might be um, 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 a blood test. I have yet to find a normal result. Mm. A normal result is no chemicals. We all carry a body burden of chemicals, which might be organic chlorines, polybrominated biphenyls, um, toluene substances, benzene substances. We've all got them. And, mm. and that's because we live in such a polluted world. And very simple techniques for getting rid of those, heating regimes to get rid of them, reliably well. Saunas, if you've got if you're fit enough to run and exercise and shower, even better. Hot baths with Epsom salt, absolutely brilliant. So anything we can do to keep that toxic load as low as possible is going to be highly desirable. And then, of course, mitochondria, they are just the engines. But for our engines to work, we need a thyroid accelerator pedal and an adrenal gearbox. Because it's very important to match energy delivery to energy demand. The, the point here being is if we waste energy, if we piss it up the wall, as my father would say, you know, if we waste energy, then that's wasting precious resources. And that means we ain't going to survive the winter. So it's really important to very carefully match the energy we need to hunt, you know, to dig the garden, to acquire food with um, uh, energy delivery and energy wasted is inefficiency and that's where the adrenal glands and the thyroid glands are very finely tuned to make sure we have just the right of amount of energy to, for the job we need and no more than and no less than we've got to be able to do that job we've got to be able to hunt but we don't want to be wasting it of course in a world of plenty people don't notice that because you know the biggest constraint for primitive man would have been food supply now we have an abundant food supply so people aren't cognizant of this idea, but it's it's absolute vital evolutionary imperative. And broadly speaking, the thyroid gland, as I call it, base loads. That tells you what your average speed of your mitochondria is. And guess what? You know, I want my mitochondria to be going at 50 miles now, not 15 miles now. And then the adrenal gland adjusts energy delivery from second to second, from minute to minute, from day to day. And um, you know, so for saber tooth, tiger jumps out at me, my adrenaline levels will soar. And I will run the fastest mile I've ever you know, run in my life on the back of that adrenaline. Minutes, minute cortisol allows the adrenal glands to gear up and deal with stress. And on a longer term basis, maybe DHA allows the adrenal glands to gear up um, and the mitochondria to run faster. For example, dealing with chronic in, uh, an acute infection. So the control mechanisms are vital. And once you get all those players in place, um, you'll live... You will optimize your energy so you will live to your full potential. You will improve your quality of life and you will improve your quantity of life because you get that rule in place and you will resist all pathology, heart disease, cancer, degenerative conditions, Parkinson's disease, and so on. So, of course, what I would love everybody to do, 
and but life ain't like this, as you know. I would like everybody to start looking after their mitochondria straight away. Diet, supplements, detox regime, sort out the, uh, the thyroid, sort out the adrenal glands. And uh, infectious disease will then become a thing of the past. Um, you know, degenerative disease will become a thing of the past. And we will all live to our full potential. And guess what? I'm enjoying life. That's what I want to do. And so I think if I want to do it, I'm quite sure my patients do too. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting you draw, you, you draw alert us to this important regulatory mechanism of thyroid and adrenals working together. I've often heard it described as the thyroid is where we're idling along, going along, but when we need to put our foot on the accelerator, the adrenals kick in. But thyroid disease, underactive, overactive, is, well, I hate to use the word pandemic, but anyway, it is at a very high level. Correct, correct. And, 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 and when we say thyroid disease, you know, 99 times out of 100, we're talking about an underactive. Underactive. Disease. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and that is absolutely key to getting people well. But the key point to remember here is that the thyroid gland manifests through its effects on mitochondria. So you've got to fix the mitochondria first to get the full benefit from the thyroid gland. Now, that doesn't mean, say, some people don't just get hypothyroidism as a single entity and you fix that and you're away. But I'm, I'm really thinking about patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. And if you just mm -hmm. slap them on thyroid, then the thyroid will beat up mitochondria that are not in a fit state to respond. Right. So you've got to feed the mitochondria right with the ketogenic diet. You've got to feed the mitochondria right with the raw materials to allow them to start to work. And you've got to stop poisoning them. And then your mitochondria are in a fit state. They can, they have the potential to run. And then and only then can you apply the thyroid accelerator pedal and gradually um, increase the pressure. Now, the shameful, disgraceful, awful thing about this is the endocrinologists don't know this. Hmm. And the endocrinologists, I have, I have a league table of arrogance of consultants. And that is spearheaded by the endocrinologists who think that they can diagnose the whole of thyroid disease by doing a blood test. Mm -hmm. And it's worse than that. Often they only look at one aspect of that blood test, which is the TSH. And of course, you and I are seeing patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. They, many of them do not have primary hypothyroidism. They have secondary hypothyroidism because the pituitary gland is down. And so their TSH is normal. So these poor fatigued patients trot along to the um, endocrinologist asking all the right questions, i.e., I think I'm hypothyroid. The endocrinologists say, oh, no, the TSH is fine. Go away. And, and they are left helpless, you know, you know, with no assistance whatsoever. So one of the things I tell my patients very early on is there's only one person that's going to get you well, and that's you. I can give you the rules of the game and the tools of the trade, but you've got to actually walk the path and get yourself better. And guess what? There's nobody better incentivized um, to get yourself well than yourself. Mm. So, yeah. um, I, so the point about thyroid is, yes, you can fix it yourself with the help of glandulars. Now, when hypothyroidism or myxedema was first you know, described in the 1920s and the 1930s, the only tool they had to treat it was dried pig thyroid gland. It was called armor thyroid. And guess what? It was the best. And in the right. 1930s, all those endocrinologists treating their patients, used to, they used to listen to them. They used to you know, hear what they had to say, you know, how are you feeling? What are your energy levels like? What's your, how's the sleep? You know, let's look at your pulse rate. What's your core temperature? What's your blood pressure? And they would adjust the dose of thyroid according to clinical picture. And that's what we should be doing today. That is the best sort of medicine. So we start our patients today on dried pig thyroid gland. You can also use dried cow thyroid gland. It comes under lots of names. Armor thyroid, natural thyroid, thyroid S, um, 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 uh, natural desiccated thyroid, metavig. You know, there are lots of preparations on the market, but they're all fundamentally the same thing. They're, they're dried animal glands and they have active hormones in them and they are the best treatment for treating um, the underactive thyroid. Now, the key to using them is we have to start with very low doses and increase very slowly. And the reason for that is because thyroid hormones aren't just responsible for how fast mitochondria go, 
they're also partly responsible for the number of mitochondria. And from an energy perspective, that's the difference between having a little engine with not many mitochondria and a big engine with lots of them. And guess what? You know, I want to be driving around in a Rolls Royce, not a De Chaveau. So, so start with modest doses of, of, of thyroid uh, glandular or natural desiccated oil and build up very gradually. And most people end up needing um, about between one and two grains of natural thyroid which is equivalent to 60 milligrams to 120 milligrams of, of um, desiccated thyroid or whatever. They, they come in in various doses. But do go slowly with that and monitor that with how do you feel? What's my pulse rate? What's my blood pressure? And of course, now we have all these apps. So we can monitor ourselves properly and responsibly, you know, at home and sort it out. If you've got a therapist to help you, well, that's even better. But um, uh, it works brilliantly well. And underactive thyroid is fantastically common you may be aware of mm. the work of dr kenneth blanchard consultant endocrinologist in america he reckons that about 40 percent of westerners are hypothyroid now that's in the normal population in the mm. chronic fatigue me population you can double that wow. now of course the temptation for anybody listening thinking i've got chronic disease oh let's rush out and get some of these things and you know feel better tomorrow it ain't like that. You've got to do the whole shooting match. You've got to put the mitochondria in a fit state to respond. And that is a ketogenic diet, preferred fuel of mitochondria ketones, a mitochondrial package of supplements. Start the detox regimes and then you will start to get a good response to the thyroid and the adrenal extracts. So I'm one of the things I'm you know, I've realized now, and of course this is forty years into 40 years of doing it wrong, <laughs> 40 years of many blind avenues and, and, and patient patients who have been willing guinea pigs, is not only, not only do we now know what the regimes are, we now know they've got to be done in a certain order. And in the early days, I would give people a shopping list of things to do. Well, there's this supplement and there's this glandular and there's this detox regime. And guess what? You know, they cherry pick the easy things. Mm -hmm. And guess what the most difficult thing is? Doing the ketogenic diet but it's also the most important. It's mm. absolutely vital. And actually, what I skipped over, forgive me, is there's another really, really important reason for doing a ketogenic diet. And that is because if you have spent decades fueling your body with sugars and carbohydrates, so, you know, muesli and toast for breakfast, biscuits and crisps mid-morning, sandwiches at lunchtime, cake for afternoon, pasta, and you know, all the, that sort of stuff. If you spent decades eating like that, then you will have an upper fermenting gut. Now, as you and I know, the upper gut should be sterile. It should be an acidic digesting gut for the business of, of um, uh, digesting meat and fat. But if you've got a fermenting gut, it means the, the microbes have moved in, the bacteria have moved in, the fungi have moved in, and every time you eat a sugar or carbohydrate, they are busy fermenting away. What does that give us symptoms of? Indigestion, heartburn, reflux, bloating, burping, feeling full. You know, lots of digestive symptoms. Now, if your upper gut is full of bacteria and fungi, when you start taking vitamins and minerals, the bacteria and the fungi say, yum, yum, thank you very much. That is, you know, that's nectar. You're just feeding the bugs. You know, so you're going to malabsorb. They're not going to go to where they're needed, which is in your body, to the mitochondria. So... Um, First, to be, able to, malabsorb, to be able to absorb all those expensive supplements, you've got to get rid of your fermenting gut. And there's another problem here. You know, what do these microbes ferment to produce? Well, they ferment to produce nasty toxins. It's called the autobrewery syndrome. And when, as those microbes ferment, you get horrible things like alcohol, D-lactate, hydrogen sulfide, ammoniacal compounds, and they all poison our mitochondria. So it's a real double whammy. It's, you know, you can't get the nutrients in and you're poisoning the whole system at the same time. And then on top of that, you've got bacterial endotoxin. You've got fungal mycotoxins. And we all know those poison mitochondria and the liver and everything else like nothing else. And then there's another major, major problem. And I think this is a, a massively overlooked driver of pathology. You, know, you and I, Ron, we are taught at medical school that yes, the gut is full of bacteria, and there they stay. We now know that's not true. We now know those microbes very easily get from the gut into the bloodstream. 
It's called bacterial translocation. It's a well-recognized phenomenon. You know, one example of that, if you brush your teeth and you take a blood sample two minutes later, you find dental bacteria in your bloodstream. That's why people with heart disease, they're given antibiotics before any dental procedure because they don't want those bacteria to infect the heart valves. So if you've got you know, this tsunami of bacteria you know, pouring into the bloodstream all the time, that presents a real problem for the immune system because bacteria are potentially foreign invaders. It's potential septicemia. And wherever those microbes end up in the body will drive inflammation. So if they end up in the blood vessels, you could get um, polyarteritis nodosa. If they get into the muscles, you can get polyuralgia um, uh, rheumatica. In the blood vessels, temporal arteritis. If they get into, um, again, the muscles, fibromyalgia, the skin, chronic urticaria, the joints, arthritis. So many arthritides we now know are driven by bacteria. In fact, when I was at the Middlesex Hospital Medical School in the 1970s, we had a consultant there called Dr. Alan Ebringer, rheumatologist. He demonstrated that ankylosing spondylitis is driven by a microbe in the gut called Klebsiella. And if, the, if you are a particular tissue type, which is HLA B27 positive, that to the, to the immune system looks exactly like Klebsiella. So the bacteria make antibodies against Klebsiella, which cross-react with ligaments in the spine, and you get inflammation there. And so, um, and guess how Ebringer was treating his patients? With low-carbohydrate diets. Interesting. Hygienic diets and curing their ankylosing spondylitis. Yeah. With, the, with this bacterial overgrowth, I mean, it's referred to, if I'm not mistaken, as SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Yes, but that's too narrow a term. Okay. Upper fermenting gut is a much better term because it doesn't infer upper an fermenting. organism. And the upper fermenting gut will, in, will, you know, in, will embrace SIBO. The problem with calling it SIBO is the gastroenterologists do a test for SIBO and say, oh, negative, you know, and, and thereby, therefore, people assume, well, I haven't got enough of fermenting gut, so I can continue with my wicked ways. But, you know, the upper fermenting gut embraces parasites, embraces fungi, it embraces bacteria, which might be aerobic bacteria, and it might be an anaerobic bacteria. But the treatment of all those things, is, the starting point for treatment, anyway, is the same. First of all, you starve them out with a ketogenic diet, which is high in fat and high in fiber. You, that's what you fuel the body with. And then you kill them. And you start off killing them with vitamin C. Now, vitamin C is one of my favorite multitasking tools. Um, uh, humans need at least five grams daily. That's 5,000 milligrams daily. Put it wow. in your bottle of water, put it in your glass, drink yep. it little and often through the day. Why do we need so much? Because that's what the rest of the animal kingdom get. You know, all other animals, it, pretty much all animals except um, humans, fruit bats, and guinea pigs, all other animals, my dog, you know, the horses, the cattle, the sheep lines out there, they can all make their own vitamin C. And they make you know, the equivalent of about five grams a day. And more importantly, when they have an infectious stress or a toxic stress, they can massively increase the amount of vitamin C they make to deal with that. And we should do the same. We should copy nature. So base load with five grams of vitamin C. And that keeps the upper gut clean and tidy because it contact kills all microbes. In fact, I wrote a book about this called The Infection Game, about the whole of, 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 of the immune system and, uh, and how we deal with microbes. And um, as I was doing that, I started to thought, oh, I wonder if vitamin C has been ever used to treat Helicobacter pylori. Now, Helicobacter pylori, like you Australians, you know, you, you discovered it. Um, Barry Marshall um, discovered Helicobacter pylori in, in Melbourne. And, uh, and, um, well, well, now, hang on, Sarah, just for our listener that may not be aware, peptic ulcers, the ulcers in the stomach were used to be treated in one way, but it, then it realised that it was actually a bacterial overgrowth. Voila, it's another example of the upper fermenting gut. You know, the upper mm -hmm. fermenting gut includes Helicobacter pylori. So I asked the question, because Helicobacter pylori is a difficult microbe to get rid of. You know, it's, it's, it's two or three weeks of antibiotics and proton pump inhibitors, and even then it's only 90% success. So I asked myself the question, does vitamin C get rid of Helicobacter pylori? And I found a Polish study where they had asked that very same question, and they treated their patients 
with just five grams of, H, of um, vitamin C daily for a month. Now, if you'd asked me that, I said, well, that's a waste of time. It's not a big enough dose of, of vitamin C. You're still eating a normal, you know, carbohydrate diet. The chance of getting rid of H. pylori, in my guess, are very small. Even with that regime, 30% of patients cleared their helicobacter pylori. So my guess... Without, without the ketogenic diet. Correct. Mm -hmm. So you add the ketogenic diet to that and you're going to make that even more powerful. And then you stick with the ketogenic diet for life because that's the evolutionary correct diet. And you're going to slowly starve those helicobacter pylori out over the weeks and the months and probably get rid. Now, that study has not been done and I would love to do it, but, you know, I don't have the wherewithal to do it. But it illustrates the point that vitamin C is a great way of cleaning up the upper gut. And you've got to get rid of your upper fermenting gut to start to heal your mitochondria. And we do that with ketogenic diet, vitamin C to bowel tolerance. Sometimes I use other in things like mastica gum is, 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 is often very useful. Um, and, the, and, and most people find their digestion so much better. Those upper gut symptoms disappear. Their irritable bowel syndrome settles. Their inflammatory bowel disease improves. You know, you know, you know clinically that your patients are better. And they know themselves that they're better. And that, uh, one symptom that often clears is the foggy brain. You know, so often people say, you know, I can think, you know, suddenly, you know, because I'm not poisoning my brain with, 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 with the products of the fermenting gut. I mean, if, if I had to have a glass of wine in the morning, you know, I wouldn't get any dark work done, that's for sure, you know, because the brain would be foggy, I'd be tired, you know, I couldn't problem solve, I couldn't multitask, I certainly couldn't, you know, talk with any fluency. Uh, but if you are fermenting, you're doing that all the time. You know, mm. have a bowl of porridge with fruit juice and toast and marmalade for breakfast and you're fermenting and you're going to be foggy all day mm. well let's let go on go on you were going to say i was just going to ask to to focus on this ketogenic diet because it's a it's a term that rolls off the tongue often in various uh fields and and we've done many programs on low carb on the low carb approach and i guess the question is if we're going down that low carb ketogenic diet what level of carbohydrate intake do you feel is is acceptable okay the answer is very simple um it's the amount of carbohydrate you can need to get into ketosis and you work that out by measuring right. now there are three ways we can measure now the best way the most accurate way to measure is to measure beta hydroxybutyric acid in the bloodstream and there are lots of home kits you can buy yourself a kit and you can do that yourself. Now, the problem with that is you have to have a sample of blood, which means pricking your finger. And guess what? I'm a wimp. I don't like pricking my finger. <laughs> me too. Me too. <laughs> and it's worse than that. Test strip costs a pound each. And guess what? Huh. I'm mean. So, okay. But if, if you're a, a perfectionist, then that's the one to use. Mm -hmm. Second, you can use keto sticks and you can pee on them. Um, and that measures acetoacetate in the urine. And in the early stages of ketogenic diet, um, 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 then ketones will pour out into the urine and the pink sticks will go purple and then you know you're in ketosis. But with time, the body gets better at managing fat burning and energy requirements because if you're peeing out ketones, you're peeing out calories, you really are wasting you know, um, precious fuel and the body doesn't like doing that. And what many people find is once they've you know, established, once they've in, went into ketosis, very often the, the, the pea sticks, you know, um, don't show when they should be. So that's why these days I prefer the breath tests, which are very easy and very quick. And mm. it takes, you buy a ketone breath meter, which costs about £40 uh, UK money. Um, um, it takes 20 seconds to warm up and then you just exhale into them. Because when you're in ketosis, you produce acetones and the acetones you exhale and you get a reading. Now, the key thing to remember about the breath meters is you have to treat them with a little bit of respect because they're measuring acetones in parts per million. They are super sensitive. If you And it's the same technology as for measuring alcohol. So if you had a sip of alcohol or if you've got a fermenting gut and you are producing alcohol, you can blow false positives. So it's not a thing to take along to a party and say, let's use in ketosis, because all those who had a, you know, a couple of tinnies will blow positive and, 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 and think, that, think that they have arrived. So mm -hmm. you've got to be somewhere near with a ketogenic diet and um, um, in order to know that you're there. But once you are blowing ketones, you've arrived. And any amount will do. 0.5 will do, 1 will do. On my fasting days, sometimes I blow you know, 8 or 10 parts per million. And that is you know, a 
tells you that you're well in ketosis, you're in fat burning. And the reason for that is sugar and carbohydrates are very nasty, toxic compounds. Now, they are essential. We do need sugar. It is an essential part of metabolism because from the six carbon sugar that we get from fruit and vegetables, that can be converted into a five carbon sugar, which is the raw material to make DNA, to make RNA and to make ATP. And we also use sugar to detoxify in a process in the liver called glucuronidation. So sugar is essential for the body. Don't be in any doubt about it. But it's also very dangerous stuff. It's such dangerous stuff that if we have too much of it, the body burns it in mitochondria to get it out of the way. So we will always burn sugar first in preference to fats. The point being, if you're, so if you're blowing any amount of ketones, you know, 0.5, one part per million, two part per million, that means you've got your sugar under control and, um, and, uh, and you ha you ha you're not, you know, um, uh, giving, you're, you're not overwhelming the body with sugars and carbohydrates. So, so that will do. Does the body just, once you're in ketosis, that's the fuel? I mean, if things change in a 24-hour period, your body could switch a little bit to the... Or meta yeah. it, it, it moves between the two fuel sources yeah. constantly, doesn't yes, it? Yes, and that's called metabolic flexibility. And guess what? In, the, in, in this month of September, and I'm a gardener, I've got plums in the garden at the moment, I've got um, raspberries, you know, I've got um, blueberries, and I love them and I eat them. And I'm not in ketosis all the time. Mm. Sometimes I slip out, but that doesn't matter because within a few hours I'm back in ketosis again. And that metabolic flexibility, the ability to move from one fuel source to another is very helpful. So long as most of the time you're in ketosis, that will do very nicely. Thank you very much. But it still comes down on a daily basis when people get started on this to reducing your carbohydrate intake, doesn't it? Yes. Because Significant. Most, yeah. Most people are not in ketosis. Most people, you know, we have, you know, the, our children at school are taught this risable food pyramid where we should be base loading with mm. carbohydrates, lots of pasta yep. and grains, and it's rubbish. <laughs> well, it's yeah. a wonderful economic model, just not a very good health model. That's where it's driven by, you know. It's yes. the old story, <laughs> follow the money, you know. If, if, you, if you, you know, grow a ton of potatoes and you convert that into crisps, you can make 10,000 quid, you know. Um, mm. You know, they're cheap, easy fuels. Now, it's not such a problem when you've got a population that's physically active and burning it off. Um, and, you know, if, if I had an, I mean, if I had an athlete that I was training for sprinting, then I would want them for that sprint probably to be running on sugars because it is rocket fuel in the short term. It's just so damaging in the longer term. But you know, if we were very physically active so we, and we were carb loading and burning it off in the day, I mean, when... We, uh, when we moved, when I moved to Upper Western in, in 1990, we, in, we inherited an old boy born in the 1920s, and he could remember cutting hay by hand, and that was during the 1930s. And he said the daily ration was um, 10 pints of cider throughout wow. the day. And he said we never got drunk, we never got pissed because we were so physically active. You know, they were it was hard mm, physical mm. work. You know, for hours and hours a day, cutting and cutting and cutting. And they needed that alcohol and they needed that sugar to fuel them. And fuel them it did, and it hydrated them as well. But, of course, we're just not sufficiently physically active to deal with all the sugar and carbohydrates we're pouring into our systems now. And I'm certainly not you know, that physically active. Okay, I love exercise, but what am I going to do? I'm going to be sitting in front of my computer. I'm going to be seeing patients. You know, I'm not going to be you know, running around and doing things. So, yes, you know, carbohydrates are great fuels if you're physically active and you're burning them off. But we're just not these days. And mm. say so the joy of the ketone breath meter is you can tell exactly where you are. I mean, I have a dear friend of mine, again, incredibly strong, active. He eats loads of carbs. When, when I test him, he's always in ketosis because he's just mm. burning the carbs off as fast as he's <laughs> consuming them. Yeah. So what are some foods that we should be eating that will promote that for us, given we may not be exercising enough? Okay. When, uh, when it came apparent to me that um, uh, you know, the ketogenic diet was central, the first thing I realized I had to do is, was find a bread substitute because bread is such a universal food. You can eat it any time. And to cut a very, I got it early every morning for about six months and experimented with different grains and this. And, that. and I put together a recipe for paleo ketogenic bread, which is based on linseed. And the joy of linseed is it's 2% carbohydrate, it's 26% fiber. 
So A, that fibre prevents you getting constipated. B, that fibre is happily fermented in the large bowel by the friendly microbes to produce short-chain fatty acids, which are another form of ketones. So linseed is a fabulous um, you know, food if you want a bread substitute. And from linseed, you know, in the cookbooks, there are recipes for pastry. You can make um, keto pizza if you want to, you know, and so on. So that's a great start. Hmm. Um, and then don't be afraid of fat. You know, so many people are terrified of eating fat. And we have this you know, risable hypothesis, a high fat diet causes high cholesterol that causes you know, arterial disease, rubbish, rubbish, rubbish as you know a very a very popular theme on our program uh, you're in good company here sarah don't worry okay so the point is you know find things that are fatty so my normal breakfast would be a couple of boiled eggs um keto bread um and because i'm so allergic to dairy i have um uh, a, a, a butter which is not which is dairy free but butter would be fantastic that's a fantastic fuel and the point is with that fiber and with that fat on board and in ketosis you don't get hungry I mean, mm. I, I, you know, if I'm physically in the garden working all day, I, I, I never, I, I don't bother to eat because I forget and I'm, I'm busy in the garden working. If I'm sitting at my desk, okay, I'll often have a snack at lunchtime, which might be um, uh, vegan cheese, it might be a big salad, it might be last night's leftovers. Uh, evening meal is usually meat. I'm very lucky. I've got my own pigs, so there's lots of fat on that meat. <laughs> yes, sometimes I have chips. But you know, my idea of chips is you know, a, a little bit of potato and cooked with lots and lots and lots of fat. And they're divine. They're crunchy. They're crispy. They're tasty and hugely satisfying. And um, my pudding will be berries with coconut milk, which is, again, um, very uh, low in carbohydrates. So I have a, an incredibly varied diet. It's very satisfying. I never get hungry. I never run out of fuel. Um, I don't wake up in the night. You know, the commonest cause of disturbed sleep is hypoglycemia because if you're running on carbs your blood sugar is up down up down every time your blood sugar goes up you pour out insulin every time your blood sugar comes down you pour out adrenaline what's adrenaline do in the middle of the night it wakes you up so so many of my chronic fatigue patients you know they complain of poor quality sleep and insomnia get into ketosis and the quality of sleep is improved very quickly Hmm. Now we've talked, we've touched on, and I'm sure there's many more areas of nutrition we could explore. But you've also mentioned getting rid of toxins, and um, apart from making responsible decisions, informed decisions, which is a really powerful tool to have. Um, you also mentioned saunas and, and baths. How often should one do that? Okay. You know, okay. yeah. What, what's what's well, the... I collected lots of data to ask to ask the question: How effective are these regimes? Data hmm. like fat biopsies, like blood tests. And what I find is that roughly speaking, 50 heating regimes will halve your toxic load. Wow. So, um, and when I mean, uh, and as important as the heating regime is the washing up afterwards. I'll tell you a really interesting, a lovely story about a family who came to see me in the early 90s, well, late 1980s. They, their house, the whole house had been sprayed for um, cockroaches or fleas or something. And what do they use? Organophosphates. The whole family were poisoned. The whole family got sick with the chronic fatigue syndrome, came to see me. So they all wanted to be tested because money was no object, luck, which was always very nice. Tested, they all had high doses, high levels of organophosphate in their blood and in their fat. So I said, well, you've got to do these heating regimes. So they decided to go off on holiday and they went off to a spa town in Eastern, U in Eastern Europe called Danubius. And there they had three weeks of saunering, hot tubs, massage showers you know all that stuff that they've been doing in europe for years as just standard mainstream you know medicine uh, for three weeks and then they came back and they said after the holiday they said oh can you retest it i said no 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 i said it you know, clever me you know i said it's far too early you know you will we'll, you know, so, no they said you know we've got lots of money we want to be tested do you know what they got rid of their organophosphates with wow. three weeks, okay, now it's every day and it's very posh and they had lovely food as well, but they had got rid of their load. And, mm. and I found that. And, and, and actually, by the time they'd been in the hot tub and then they'd been showering and then they'd been sunbathing, because all these, it doesn't matter what technique you use. It doesn't matter if you use sunshine, if you use hot water, if you use steam. You know, the point is, is as you, as you get hot, toxins that are in the subcutaneous fat are mobilized onto the lipid layer of the surface of the skin and then you wash them off in the shower. And so they just mobilized, mobilized, washed off, washed off, and got rid. So I think 
we should all, because we live in a toxic world, we should all be doing one heating regime a week, whether it's a hot bath, sunshine. If you can, if you can exercise and get fit, you know, run and get fit and sweat. The key thing is to shower off afterwards in order to maintain the status quo. And then if you are poisoned, then you do it more often. And at the same time, of course, you've got to stop loading up with the stuff. There's no point pulling toxins out if you're poisoning yourself with cosmetics, you know, smelly um, cleaning agents, um, you know, um, uh, spray drift. Um, uh, they're, they're, they are the major cause, you know, dental amalgam, you know, all these poisons that, that we are um, using all the time, which we think are OK and they're not. So clean up your environment, do the detox regime. You will never get rid of every last toxin, but that doesn't matter because the body can cope quite well with a, a low toxic load. We have the enzyme systems in place to deal with that. It's when we get overwhelmed with prescription drugs, addictions, um, you know, uh, poisoning the environment, air fresheners, that's when the whole thing starts to break down. And that showering is enough just to get under a shower and let the water run off, or should we be scrubbing what should we be doing there? Well, it's the it's the, the toxins come out into the fat, so you want a bit of soap. You want a bit of soap, mm. wash that lipid layer off your skin. If 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 afterwards, and this is what I do, um, I love coconut oil. When I finish my shower, I actually put on um, coconut oil because I love the smell of it. I love the feel of it. I got some lovely. It's cheap as chips. It's it's the body identical um, fat, and um, so again, you know that helps to replace the good you near know, the the dirty fats you've washed off with the clean fats and i think that's a great way to detox mm. and and with um the mitochondria how do i mean do we just take a history how do we test for our mitochondrial dysfunction although it sounds like almost everybody's mitochondria is not working optimally in our modern world yeah. but how do we test for it well um there are various ways you can look i mean um, I worked for many years with a wonderful laboratory, Biolab in London, and then Acumen, and that was run by Dr. John McCarran Howard. And he developed a test called ATP studies, which is the most complete test of mitochondrial function uh, that's available. But the trouble is, to do that test, you have to be a biochemical genius, you have to be a laboratory wizard, and you need uh, lots of raw materials. And unfortunately, Brexit and COVID has put um, a pay to that. But there are very often tests that you can do, like the organic acid test, which looks at cofactors in Krebs citric acid cycle. Easy test to do on a urine sample. Um, um, and um, uh, you can get an awful lot of clues from that uh, about what the mitochondria are doing. But the fact of the matter is, I rarely do these tests. And the reason I rarely do them is because the patients that I'm dealing with haven't got any money because they can't work because they have no energy. And there's no point doing tests when I know what the result is going to be. So I tend to save tests for the moment at which we get stuck and we really don't know what's going on. Because when this mitochondrial function test became available, um, um, uh, we published many, well, we published many of our results. And the first uh, results we published were 71 patients who'd done the basic workup, you know, the diet, you know, what I thought were the right supplements. This was in the 19, uh, in the noughties, and, um, and we got stuck. And at that point, I measured their mitochondrial function because we had the test. And what was so fascinating is those with the worst level of energy had the worst mitochondrial function and vice versa. And this test, this study was done blind because I saw the patients and we agreed what their clinical energy score was. We sent the bloods to the lab to be tested and John McLaren Howard did the actual tests and he worked out, you know, so he measured how well the mitochondria were going. And the results went to a third party, uh, Professor um, um, Norman Booth at Mansfield College, Oxford. And he um, analysed the mitochondrial function test and brought it all together. So although it wasn't placebo controlled, double blind, it was blinded. You know, I didn't know what the mito results were and, and, and John certainly didn't know what the clinical um, disability was. So the results were astonishing. And that paper that was published in 2009 was the first paper that really demonstrated that, you know, a central lesion in patients with chronic fatigue and ME was mitochondrial dysfunction, i.e. this is a physical disorder. I wrote a book on the back of it, which I called it, it's mitochondria, not hypochondria. And that went yes. down very well. <laughs> well, that, that does raise, that's, I love that too. Um, that does raise another issue, doesn't it? Where, and, and, and it's very frustrating, I think, for patients and chronic fatigue was a good example of this, is 
people would present with a, a set of symptoms and the doctor just didn't know what was wrong with them. So rather than say, I don't know what's wrong with you, they would be told there is nothing wrong with you. And therein is a very, it rolls off the tongue very easily, but the difference is there was a world of difference between those two statements. Isn't that, I that, mean... That, that dishonest medicine. Hmm. The first lesson I learned uh, in general practice in 1982 is never tell a patient a lie because they'll suss you out very quickly. And, and, and what I also then learned very quickly is my patients didn't mind me saying, I don't know. Yes, what that's very empowering, mind, isn't it? Yeah. As what a practitioner, that is empowering. What they did mind me saying is, I don't care. So, yes. you know, I would say, I don't know, but let's try this, let's try that. That's why I said earlier, I've been down every blind alley it's possible to go down. And, mm. you know, and I've gone to bed at night, you know, fretting and worrying about the whys and, and the wherefores. And, and now the whole thing is beginning to unravel. But the awful thing about the conventional doctors is not only do they say, I don't know and I don't care. They just consign these patients to the psychiatric dustbin. And the treatment of chronic fatigue syndrome in this country has been given over to the psychiatrists. And really? the psychiatrists say oh, a bit of cognitive behaviour therapy, a bit of graded exercise, and you will get well. And worse than that, they set up a study called the PACE study, which was published in 2011, uh, where they took patients and they treated them with graded exercise and um, cognitive behaviour therapy. And they told the world that they had got 61% patients better and cured 22%. And we now know that was a big, fat lie. And mm. I spent the last decade exposing that lie together with many other academics all over the world and we now know it is rubbish and we're on we're at a very interesting point at the moment because when that study was published it became part of you know nice guidelines you know nhs guidelines that yes treat chronic fatigue in patients with graded exercise and that graded exercise remained in the nice guidelines making patients worse you know time and time and time again until the nice guidelines were reviewed now, they should have been published on the 17th of August this year. And hours before they're due to be published, they were paused. We now know why the new NICE guidelines had dropped graded exercise therapy because it's making people, patients worse and thereby disgraced the psychiatrists. Hmm. We now know that the psychiatrists are working very hard behind the scenes to try and get graded exercise back on the agenda in order to support their untenable, you know, unsupportable theories. And there's a big battle going on. There's a big um, 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 demonstration in London yesterday outside you know, uh, NICE to get rid of grade exercise because it's making patients worse. So, yes. NICE is, just for our listeners in Australia, NICE, N-I-C-E, is, I don't know what the acronym stands for, but it's a national, um, it's kind of a health guidelines uh, body yeah nice um yes well chronic fatigue is kind of have, uh, was often associated with a post viral infection wasn't it yeah. which puts which is actually very interesting in our current environment absolutely. i mean <laughs> absolutely. Now, again the key point to remember about chronic fatigue syndrome and post viral syndrome which we call me myalgia encephalomyelitis the key difference is it's all about mechanism and chronic fatigue syndrome is all about poor energy delivery mechanisms. And ME is all about inflammation and poor energy delivery mechanisms. Right. And, of course, ME has suddenly become newsworthy because long COVID, we now find, is common. And long COVID is another form of ME. It's another form of post-viral chronic fatigue syndrome. And um, because, you know, we're seeing uh, all these people with COVID actually not as many as, 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 as they would have us believe, but that's another very big story. Um, about 10% of patients are developing long COVID, i.e. a persistent chronic fatigue uh, following their um, acute COVID infection. Now, we know how to treat that. You know, us functional medicine doctors, us doctors who are interested in um, uh, the root causes, you know, we know how to treat that. And we have you know, very useful tools to do that, which, yes, is energy delivery mechanisms, and also interventions to improve immune function, which, guess what, starts off with good old vitamin C, uh, because vitamin C, you know, uh, kills virus. But there are lots of other antivirals, as you know, that are available that we've been using for years 
and are not being employed by conventional medics. Mm. I mean, the, the, the ele- one of the elephants in the room is ivermectin. Mm. Now, ivermectin you know, is widely used in the veterinary world to treat parasites, but what's so fascinating about it is it has very good antiviral activity as well. It's excellent at treating uh, acute COVID. You know, those states in India, uh, and, and in India, of course, where parasite problems are common, anybody, can, any Joe, can buy um, um, uh, ivermectin over the counter at the local pharmacy. And in those states where you know, the powers that be have said, yeah, if you get acute COVID, go and get yourself from uh, ivermectin, you know, there has been no pandemic. There have been no deaths from COVID because they just go along and treat themselves with ivermectin. You know, it's a great treatment. It's not so easy to get in in UK and Australia, I'm sure. But Hmm. we have fabulous um, nutritional tools. Number one, of course, is a low carbohydrate diet. You know, the death rate in diabetics and the and the obese is far higher than death rates in people who are um, of of normal weight. But vitamin D, so important. I mean, you Australians have the lowest vitamin D levels in the world because you're so sun phobic. And of course, I'm quite sure you realize that is a nonsense. Sunshine is very good for us. Get out in it. Okay, don't burn, don't fry. But, you know, by the end of the summer, we should be lovely brown, tanned because, you know, um, we've been out in the sunshine, we're full of vitamin D and that vitamin D then lasts us through the winter. But those pale skin people will have no vitamin D. And the risk of death, uh, there's a direct straight line relationship between the risk of death and your vitamin D levels. Hmm. And I, like all my patients, take 10,000 IU of vitamin D daily. People say, oh, that's a big dose. It isn't. That's an hour of sunshine. How much sunshine did primitive man get? Well, 12 hours of sunshine. You know, he got a lot more and he had lovely high levels of vitamin D. So 10,000 IU of vitamin D, five grams of vitamin C and a paleoketogenic diet and you will get COVID and not know you've had it. You will get no symptoms from it. You will sail through it, and your risk of death will be zero. So why don't we use these tools to control this pandemic, you know? Hmm. Well, there's a big question, Sarah, and that's going to be the topic for another podcast because uh, I suspect so much of what we're seeing here is more about a business model than a public health model. But listen... I want to thank you for joining us today. I can see why I've been so looking forward to talking to you. And honestly, I could sit and listen to you for hours on end because I've learned and I've and it's alerted me to so much. Oh, Sarah, goodness. thank you. Thank you so much for joining My us. Absolute pleasure. And uh, just a little thing. I, I regularly do, and they're very popular, um, workshops online like this. And I'm joined by people from all over the world. And we have great fun. I max out at 20. Anybody can stop because, as you know, I'm gobby. I love talking. Um, um, anybody can stop, wave, ask a question, any point, and uh, we have lots of fun. And any subject, is, it tends to be mainly about chronic fatigue or ME. But if people get onto my website, anybody can buy a ticket and join me and uh, and have a fun day. Well, we will most certainly have links to that and, and promote that because it will be it would be a wonderful experience. Sarah, thank you so much for today. My pleasure. Now, there is so much in this episode. I am definitely going back and listening to it again with a paper, a pen and paper to record. Well, there'll be transcripts. So let's not forget to have a good close look at the transcripts because there is such great information here, which is so fundamentally important to every disease. And I loved uh, Sarah's um, analogy of our health being like a book And uh, that book requires writing, which requires an alphabet. And if you start to remove any letters of the alphabet, then that book just doesn't make sense. And similarly, our cells uh, require an alphabet of nutrients, of, of essential nutrients. We've talked about that many times, that the body requires something like 50 or 60 different elements in the periodic table. It also requires some essential fatty acids. That's why they're called essential, because we can't make them. It also requires some essential vitamins, like vitamin C, which we as primates can't make, and essential amino acids, because again, we can't make those. There are about 20 amino acids that make up proteins, And eight of those are referred to as essential because we simply can't make them. So these 
alphabets, these letters of the alphabet that we, we require to make sense of the book that is your life, that is your health, is really critically important. And I, I just thought it was a great discussion. And we will, of course, have links to Sarah's website. And, and if you are interested, I would recommend that you join her on her uh, workshops that she runs online and attracts an audience from all over the world on a regular basis. And you can see her passion, her knowledge is, is just so inspiring. Um, so I, I, I think it's a wonder. I was so looking forward to talking to Sarah. I first met Sarah when she was a speaker at last year's global online conference from the Australasian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine. And I was just struck by the depth and breadth of her knowledge, her enthusiasm and passion and her ability to communicate all of that. So I hope if you haven't gone onto our website and explored uh, some of the wellness programs that are out there, we're working on an online wellness program. We're working on a subscription model. We're curating old episodes that will bring a whole new breadth to uh, our podcast. We've realized that so many podcasts we've done are absolute gems and we've actually gone back and curated and commentate, commented on some of those. So it is really our Unstress Lab podcast, which takes our podcasting to another level. So look into that, look into subscribing and joining us. Uh, and there are so many wonderful resources available to, to you if you do. Uh, I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences, and conclusions.